Hello YouTube. Bane666 here. Welcome to Propaganda of Toxic Feminism. The series in which I expose and debunk falsehoods, misconceptions, and outright lies spread about the men's rights movement. So let's get stuck into it. This first story is a very interesting one. It's about a young man at a university in England who wants to start a male-orientated group to discuss male issues like suicide. Can you guess where this is headed? It's the perfect example why feminism is an issue, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's start at the beginning. From the tab, meet the founder of the new male human rights society. Men can be and are often victims of real problems. Societies and Facebook groups for feminism are at every uni, but what about ones for male human rights? Third-year linguist Adam Frost, 21, is currently on a year abroad in the south of France but has set up a new group called the Durham Uni Male Human Rights Society. Claiming to be the first of its kind in the UK, they immediately raised criticism across campus as incensed students asked, isn't this a bit like starting a society for white people's rights? We spoke to Adam as he prepared to finish his year abroad and come back to start his brand new society. Adam told the tab, I found out that there are lots of problems that affect men, there are also problems that affect men less than women, definitely, such as domestic violence and rape, but men do nevertheless get affected. The problem is that their issues are not taken into account quite as much. They're not given enough attention and they're not given enough resources to deal with the problems they face. That for me is why I wanted to start the society, to bring more attention to the fact that men can be and are often victims of real problems, that's my motivation. Despite the strong reaction by many, the FEMSOC has got behind Adam because of their shared values. FEMSOC President Catherine Crick told us, we've already begun to liaise with Adam, potentially starting some sort of FEMSOC-supported men's discussion group about the issues he was right to raise. Our aims are fundamentally similar and hopefully together we can make progress towards raising awareness of these issues. FEMSOC? Sounds very Orwellian doesn't it? Although I'm guessing it would be more like, Big Mother instead of, Big Brother. But once again we have a feminist group trying to dominate and control all discussion on gender. I have to ask, why can't there be alternative views? Or alternative groups using different methods towards the same goals? It's important to note that Adam Frost is not anti-feminist, at least for now, and he actually supports FEMSOC, he just wants his own space for his own group. And let's face it, we all know that any male issues discussed by FEMSOC are going to be done exclusively through feminist theory. I can just imagine some guy who has suicidal thoughts, because he was molested by his mother as a child, being told that he is privileged because penis, and he just needs to be more considerate towards women. Actually if he said he had been molested by his mother, they could possibly lynch him, or their heads could explode. Because we all know feminists hate to talk about female sexual predators. It destroys the narrative. So is there such a thing as a female pedophile? Oh yes. Now, female pedophiles, there's, there's a great deal of controversy about this. In fact, when I brought up the issue that women could sexually abuse children, I was vilified. I was cast out of the sisterhood. I was no longer a good feminist because sexual abuse had to be under the guise of male power. And if I had a significant number of women who were sexually abusing children and I knew about these women, then that messed up. The, the male power thing. And surely if women were going to abuse children then they had to be doing it under the thumb of a man. A man had to be telling them to do it. Do women tend to only commit child abuse if there's a man involved as well? No, no. In over 75% of the cases the women acted completely alone. Most times there wasn't even a man in, uh, in the premises. So you know, the, the excuse. And it's interesting about, about us as women because we're quite willing to accept that we are a superior breed and that we do everything right, um, but quite unwilling to accept that we could do anything quite as horrible as this. So it's, you know, it's, 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 it's really not us.
we had a conference about this eventually in I think 94, maybe earlier. 400 people applied to come to this conference. It was a huge conference. But 30 people, between 20 and 30 people came, dotted themselves in the audience and tried to disrupt it. They were yelling that, you know, this, why was I paying attention to women? It wasn't women. I was taking the attention away from men. One of the women who was going to talk about her own abuse, who was now helping others, then couldn't face the audience. So you had this uproar. You had people in the audience turning on these, these women who were standing up saying, sit down, we want to hear about this. And you had them shouting and it was just, it was absolutely strange. Um, and very sad because it was like, don't tell me this information even if it's true because I don't want to hear it. And if those women who came along to our conference had had anything to do about it, nobody else would have ever talked about it. It would have just gone away. Next. But Adam claims men need their own groups, explaining he wants to raise awareness under the FEMSOC umbrella. He said, that's handy, but I really do think a separate society would be a lot more efficient. It wouldn't strain their resources as much. It would be great if I could have my own society because it's really important and there's not enough attention being given to men's issues. Adam claims to be a feminist and an admirer of Durham Tab legend Flo Perry. I am not in any way, shape, or form, anti-feminist. I think Durham University FemSoc is amazing. There, Reclaim the Night, marches, their activism, their debates, putting in enormous names like Godfrey Bloom and I respect, amazingly, Flo Perry. So basically, the feminists really have nothing to fear from this guy, he's not anti-feminist, he's not a misogynist, he's not promoting the dreaded patriarchy, he just wants to form a group where men can discuss male issues. Shouldn't be a big deal, right? Next. The men's rights activist movement has been criticized widely online for being a superfluous group of people who either misunderstand or despise feminism. But Adam, who admits the name of his society is not fixed in stone, said, MRAs on the internet who are ruining it for people who actually care about men's issues. I've gone through their websites and they don't do anything, they're the definition of slacktivism. They're people who sit on their computers bitching about feminism. They're just ruining it. Try telling that to Sage Gerard and his Zen men. And Adam was doing so well up to here. I do have to wonder what sites he went to, or more likely what feminist propaganda he read. But you know what, I really don't care if he doesn't call himself an MRA, or if he doesn't like MRAs, just so long as his group actually does something to help men. Next. Flo Perry, who had already chatted to Adam, is wary about the name of his new group. The chemistry grad said, Adam is trying to raise awareness of some important issues. Male mental health and domestic violence aren't given enough attention. But he has a tough job on his hands trying to persuade any student to join a male human rights society. Doesn't sound particularly glamorous does it? And of course, we have to ask, why doesn't it sound glamorous? Why are male human rights so hard to accept? Aren't we human too? Flo Perry even admits that there are issues facing men. So instead of criticizing Adam for the proposed name of his society, why isn't she supporting him and trying to spread awareness about male human rights? After all, we are constantly told that feminism is for men too, right? Or is that just lip service? And the word glamorous is a weird one to use. Why should any human rights movement be glamorous? Do doctors who travel to the third world to help the poor, do it for the glamour? If you want glamour, join the university society to do with fashion, I'm sure there are many. Next. If he wants to shake association with MRAs he should probably think of a new name. You mean something like, the Mangina Association of Submission and Feminist Appeasement. Which of course would only ever talk about female issues, or how men are always to blame. Next. The issues which have moved Adam towards forming such a sensitive society have been a long time coming. Witnessing his friends either tragically commit or attempt suicide led him to reading about male cases, as well as instances of domestic violence. I spoke to a guy about male victims of domestic violence and his reaction was, 
Wait, there are men who get beaten by their wives? People aren't aware that men make up, depending on your study, roughly a third of domestic violence cases, both at the hands of men and women. They make up a third of all domestic violence deaths. Issues like these drove Adam to forming a group whose main stated aim is to raise awareness, like the dangers posed by the stigma surrounding men and mental illness. So once again, it's clear this guy has the best of intentions. He's not a misogynist. He's not an anti-feminist. Not yet anyway. He's not supporting the mythical patriarchy. He is trying to help a group, based on their needs. And you would think, that if the dictionary definition of feminism was actually true, he would be supported by feminist groups. Next. Feminism has done an amazing job of fighting that and I don't want to take away their efforts or what they've done. I can stress that enough, the society is here literally just to deal with the issues I want to deal with. A primary purpose of this society would be to provide a safe space for people who have been victims of sexual assault, intimate partner violence and other forms of abuse discrimination. We would refer them to places they can get help and form relationships with these services to provide the service to students who need help. Once again, all fair points. How could any reasonable person disagree? Note the word, reasonable. There is one small section of the article to go. Breitbart columnist and right-wing firebrand Milo Yiannopoulos backs Adam's new project. He told the tab, it doesn't surprise me to see men's rights organizations springing up on campuses. Many young men rightly feel as though society is architected against them. Nowhere is this more true than at uni. A wacky, extremist brand of feminism is in vogue at universities on both sides of the Atlantic today, concerned with patriarchy, policing, microaggressions, transgender pronouns, demanding safe spaces for imagined traumas and demeaning and ridiculing men at every opportunity. Feminists have even succeeded in establishing compulsory consent classes, at many colleges, the message of which is, men, you are all potential rapists. That's appalling, they should be scrapped. Sadly, academia being what it is, I wouldn't be surprised to see a lot of these new men's rights groups banned from campus on the spurious grounds that they make women feel, unsafe. Look out for words like, harassment, abuse and safety. These are classic strategies used by wacko lefty groups to ban people whose opinions they find challenging, or whose factual statements these bonkers activists are incapable of refuting. And I agree with Milo 100%. So you are all probably wondering what happened? Did the university approve Adam's proposal for a society to deal with men's issues? Well the good news is, they did. And if you believe that, I've got some swampland to sell you. Of course they didn't, not a chance. Despite it being needed. Despite it being well-intentioned. Despite it actually being pro-feminists, and in no way anti-feminist. It was still rejected, from, the Telegraph. Why are our universities blocking men's societies? As another society for male students to address important issues is blocked, Martin Dalby asks why universities aren't taking male concerns seriously. A male Durham University student was so moved by the suicide of a close male friend that he felt compelled to start a society for other men who may need support, only to find it blocked by the student union this week for being too controversial. Too controversial? Are you fucking serious? Controversial because it didn't want to speak about female issues, right? Next. When Adam Frost, 21, a third-year Italian and French student, proposed the Durham University Male Human Rights Society, he was ridiculed on campus, with remarks such as, isn't this a bit like starting a society for white people's rights? Adam told me, last October, a friend who was depressed reached out to me, but I didn't know what to say. I tried to help, but two weeks later I found out he'd killed himself. That hit me hard. I started looking into male suicide and found some shocking statistics. The reason behind that is that male depression isn't taken seriously, we're supposed to just, man up, and deal with it. Men are ridiculed. It's incredible how much stigma there is against male weakness. Men's issues are deemed unimportant, so I decided to start a society. And he's exactly right, 
which is why there needs to be organizations like what he was proposing. Next. But it was rejected by Durham Society's committee. They said it was controversial and that my aims were too similar to those of FEMSOC. That's just not true. They told me I could have a men's group, but only if it was a branch of the FEMSOC, which struck me as unacceptable. To show why, I went through the FEMSOC policy documents, where it specifically says, feminism exists for women, and, it would be extremely unreasonable to expect this space to support and cater for the needs of men. You know, those two paragraphs sum up perfectly one of the main reasons I am not a feminist. Sure, feminism claims to be for everyone, and it claims to care about men's needs. But at the end of the day, we are told to get to the back of the bus. You know, there is a lot of squabbling on both sides about issues that aren't a huge priority. Whether it's a sign in the subway that pisses off feminists, or the fact that Marvel gave Thor girly parts for a year, to change things up and cash in on the controversy. Sure, we should debate those things, but they are not as high a priority as male suicide. Shouldn't we assign priority based on need, instead of a complex equation where priority is based on race and gender? Male suicide is a priority, to me at least, and calling a society that wants to deal with the issue, controversial, is nothing short of fucking disgusting. And yes, I know there are good feminists out there, who really do care about male issues, but none of them seem to be in positions of power or influence. Which shouldn't come as a surprise, because the few good ones are vastly outnumbered by the ideologues. Next. So it's ridiculous to say the FEMSOC can cater for the needs of men when in a sense it discriminates against men. And here we see young Adam taking his first step in becoming an anti-feminist. They grow up so quickly don't they? Next. The documents also state that society favors men and I don't think that's true, in terms of court sentencing, child supervision orders, cancer funding and, of course, suicide. There are also lots of affirmative action initiatives to encourage women to get jobs in high-paid sectors. None of the FEMSOC's remit has anything to do with men's issues. It doesn't come onto their radar. Oh no, it looks like Adam is starting to come to the dark side of men's rights activism. And your journey towards the dark side will be complete. But seriously, in the first article he said he didn't want to be associated with MRAs because we don't do anything. Yet here he is raising the exact same concerns we do. And hitting the same brick walls. And you cannot blame men's rights activists, or even our negative image due to feminist propaganda, for the documents produced by FEMSOC. That's pure feminism at work. Next. Despite Adam making a powerfully eloquent and heartfelt case for a standalone men's group, on Thursday, Durham University's Society's Committee rejected his plea telling him he could only operate from within the feminist society. Well, yes, unfortunately we all operate within a feminist society. Oh hold on, he meant FEMSOC, sorry, I thought he was talking about society in general. Could you imagine a university telling a Muslim group that, they could only operate within a Christian society, because they are already dealing with spiritual issues? Or a conservative political group could only operate within a left-wing political group, because we already have a society dealing with politics. And here I thought so-called progressives were about diversity? Obviously not diversity of opinion. But what do I know, I'm just a heretic. Next. FAMSOC have been great, and have offered to work with me, but I don't think that's satisfactory, as they don't have men's issues as a pressing goal, he says. That's fair enough, so why can't I set up a men's group? To be clear, I'm not interested in waging ideological war against feminism and want to distance myself from those MRAs and misogynists who seem to spend a disproportionate amount of time bashing feminism. I want to help men. Instead of just bitching about stuff on the internet I want to get into activism. So clearly Adam hasn't put all the pieces together yet, and still has some way to go. It obviously hasn't occurred to him that the reason why we bash feminism, as he put it, is because of incidents just like the one that has happened to him. We didn't create FEMSOC, or their documents that ignore men's issues. We didn't create the university panel that rejected Adam's proposal. 
we didn't create a society that minimizes and dismisses important male issues. We do however speak out against those things. And are amongst the few groups who do. I think Adam needs to stop reading propaganda about us, and actually try having a conversation. He'll find that for the most part, we are on the same page. Next. Now, I'm left with the choice of setting up a society outside of the student union, but I won't get any funding, will have to pay for rooms and won't be able to book speakers without approval. It would just be guys in a cafe. It makes me incredibly disappointed in the system. It reinforces the idea that society doesn't care about men's issues. Well I could have told you that. Next. When Telegraph men asked for Durham's official take on the matter, Jolie Charlton, the student union's activities officer, said, all new society applications are considered against the same criteria. Where new groups have aims and objectives which overlap with existing groups, we recommend collaboration rather than the duplication of student groups. You know what, I've just changed my mind. This Joey Charlton guy from the student union has just totally changed my mind. Which is why I think all Jewish and Muslim university groups should be combined, right? I mean, they do worship the same God, so their objectives overlap, right? Now sure, they might hate each other, and they may worship in different ways, but the important thing here is not to duplicate student groups when their objectives overlap. Why are you all looking at me like I'm crazy? Next. The male human rights application detailed overlapping aims and objectives with several existing student groups. We recommended that they attempt to work with some of those groups in the first instance. My advice to Adam would be to turn up to every FEMSOC meeting, with as many like-minded people as possible, and demand that men's issues be talked about. Provided he isn't lynched, and instead just kicked out for derailing, and not talking about female issues, he might have a case that FEMSOC does not provide overlapping aims in practice. Not that I would expect the university panel to listen. Let's face it, they made up their minds before even considering the case. Next. But, to my mind, Durham's refusal to allow Adam to start a men's group follows a similarly depressing call made by Staffordshire University in February, when the Men's Rights Society was blocked by the university's women's network, who called it, dangerous. Dangerous? Are you fucking serious? We'll get to Staffordshire University in a minute, but first, let's finish this article. Next. Similarly, men's groups from as far afield as Australia, USA and Canada have been faced with similar left-leaning, feminist-driven flack, making it feel like modern universities support diversity in all forms, so long as it isn't male. Clearly the work of the patriarchy. Next. As a long-time advocate of men's rights and a committee member at the Being a Man Festival, which takes place later this year at the South Bank Centre in London, and which was set up to give modern men a forum to voice their concerns without fear of ridicule, Durham's decision is retrograde and counterintuitive when, specifically, the biggest killer of young men is suicide. Men need to talk now more than ever, and we know they best achieve that in men-only environments. Do we really live in a world where not offending university feminist societies is deemed more important than helping men in need? The answer to that is yes. Next. And are universities becoming increasingly hostile towards men? The latest data from UK has revealed that the gap between the number of female and male university applicants rose to record levels last year. 2014 figures showed 58,000 more female admissions. Widespread media reports of rampant, lad culture, at universities, and the establishment of compulsory consent classes at a number of institutions, helps create a stereotype that all male students are potentially dangerous sexual predators. So at one point in history, universities were male-dominated, male-centric, and undoubtedly discriminated against females. But now the pendulum has swung in the other direction, and males, most of whom were not even alive when universities discriminated against women, are now the ones being discriminated against. And amazingly, instead of evening things up, and making universities discrimination free for everyone, many feminists are instead trying to widen the gap. No doubt there will be many feminists who don't have a problem with this, and will use the historical discrimination argument as a defense. 
But this is hardly equality is it? Can you still claim to be an equality movement when you push for inequality? The gender feminist narrative, based on patriarchy theory, is built on the assumption that men are always advantaged, and women are always disadvantaged, instead of looking at actual real-world situations, or an individual's circumstances. And even within a system, like at universities across the Western world, where men are clearly discriminated against, and fall further behind every year, we still hear the narrative of men are always advantaged, and women are always disadvantaged. And this is why gender feminism, the dominant brand of feminism that has its sticky fingers in all the pies, will never be about actual equality. Next. Banning or hamstringing societies that would encourage men to speak up on serious issues further adds to the growing perception that universities are becoming unwelcoming spaces for young men. This itself is an important issue that male students at our universities should be talking about. And they shouldn't have to ask permission from their local femsoc first. I agree. This is the perfect example of feminism controlling the narrative and allowing only one point of view, which just so happens to be theirs. But let's have a look at the case from Staffordshire University. From Staff's Life. Women's Group Blasts Plan for Men's Rights Society at Staffordshire University. Exclusive. Plans by Staffordshire University students to launch a men's rights society are being blocked by its rival, Women's Network, group. Student Vajra Dutta made the suggestion for the new society when he posted his idea on the Student Union, Better Staffs Forum, page. But now members of the Women's Network Group at the University in Stoke-on-Trent have taken action against the proposal. Fiona Wood, chair of the Women's Network, even created a controversial poster asking students if a men's rights society is really needed to accelerate conversation from students. Okay, so let's have a look at this controversial poster made by the Women's Network. I'm kind of surprised there wasn't a comment about fedoras or wanting to make rape legal. But let's move on. Next. She told Staffs Live, if the men's society is about fathers for justice and issues treating men more fairly in court then that is fine. I have to ask, who the fuck put her in charge of what men should or shouldn't be allowed to discuss? Unbelievable. And am I the only one that thinks that the only men's issue she's aware of is the family court system? Next. The statement written in the forum for the Men's Rights Society was very male-centric and there was no mention of women. No mention of women? Really? Possibly because the group was intended for men and men's issues. Do you think that might be the reason there was no mention of women? Just possibly? And of course this comes from the chair of the Women's Network. I wonder which gender the Women's Network is focused on? Anyone want to bet, it's not men? Next. He was trying to raise the rights of men and lower the rights of females. Hold on. In the previous statement she said, there was no mention of women. So how exactly has she concluded that he wishes to lower the rights of women? If I were to guess, I would say, that she thinks even dealing with men's rights issues, is somehow tied to robbing women of their rights. Think about it this way, if she sees the world in black and white, where every woman is automatically a victim, and every male is automatically the oppressor, then the oppressor group asking for more rights, must seem like they are attempting to take rights away from the victim class. But society is rarely black and white. And both men and women have issues, some of which can be very serious. Both men and women can be victims, and both can be perpetrators. Classifying all women as a victim class is not empowering to women, it's a self-fulfilling prophesy. It's misogynistic. And seeing all men as dangerous oppressors is misandric. Let's pick just one men's rights topic, which was featured in the last two articles, as an example. Male suicide. How is dealing with a serious issue like male suicide taking anything away from women, how is it lowering female rights? I think it's clear that she only sees females as having issues, which is exactly why we need a men's rights movement. Next. It also talked about, the myth of the rape culture, which is a very dangerous area to talk about. I strongly believe in equality and I will fight for it no matter the sexual orientation or race of the individual. 
I want to know what Vajra Dhatu's end goal is and I am hoping to get that on Tuesday. Well, she could have tried asking him before assuming it's to lower the rights of women. And does anyone really believe she is for equality? Really? Because I don't. Next. But Men's Rights Society creator Vajra Dhatu hit back. He said, just as women face issues and challenges that arise in dependence upon their gender, so do men. While the student union provides a forum for female students as part of its liberation network there is no similar provision for male students. My vision is that the students who come along to the society will themselves initiate projects and campaigns that promote a positive image of men and masculinity. As far as the forum meeting goes, I hope to able to persuade my fellow students that advocating for the rights of one group of individuals does not mean that one is against the rights of another. Exactly right. He sounds reasonable to me. Why shouldn't men be able to meet, discuss issues, and propagate positive images of masculinity? How exactly is this harmful towards women? Next. Some students, both men and women, believe the creation of the new society should go ahead. Staffordshire University law student Zoe Katarina Ling, 21, said, I personally feel there should be a men's rights society or even better an equal rights society. Why not both? Next. Every student deserves to feel their voice is being heard, and I currently feel the Women's Network doesn't do this. I have personally felt like I cannot attend Women's Network meetings due to my views on certain situations, like my desire to be a housewife. Although the Women's Network claims to fight for equality, men are not invited to every discussion, and if you disagree it can feel like you are looked down upon. Student Chris Warwick, 32, of Golden Hill, Stoke-on-Trent, said, If women have a network or society, and so do the LGBT plus community, it is only fair a men's rights society should be allowed. And yet the mere mention of the creation of one brings about discussion into whether it should be allowed. The Women's Network allegedly finds the creation of the society, dangerous. And here we see a classic case of fear-mongering. Dangerous how exactly? Dangerous to feminist dogma maybe? Next. Anyone supporting true equality between sexes wouldn't find this dangerous at all, and so one has to come to the conclusion are they really supporting gender equality? Once again, I agree. Next. A meeting by Staffordshire Student Union has been arranged for Tuesday, February 17th in a bid to defuse the tensions between the two societies. Staffordshire University President Mel Ramsey told Staffs Live, as a students' union, we don't have any stance, but we encourage students to talk. If the majority of students ask us to do something then we will try our best to do it if it is possible. We just want everyone to get their opinions across in a good healthy debate where everyone feels like they had their voice heard. A spokesperson for the National Union of Students said, we do not know about any other men's rights society, but student unions from other universities are not at liberty to discuss the societies they make with us. A students' union meeting will then take place on Wednesday, February 18 at 6 p.m. in the students' union, September room, to discuss the issue. So I found another article, published a few days after the meeting, called, Students to Vote on Controversial Men's Rights Forum at Staffordshire University. It reads, Student Vajra Dada posted a proposal to create a society version of the forum on the university's student union, Better Staffs Forum, page. But members of the Women's Network led by Fiona Wood caused a storm when they protested against the plan. Union bosses organized a private meeting between the two groups to try and resolve the dispute, but this broke down. Now they have agreed to rename the society as a forum which does not require members to run and is open to all. All the university's students will now have a chance to vote for or against the forum dedicated to men's rights online. Men's Rights Society creator Vajra Dhatta says, After the meeting with Fiona it became apparent that there were many things in which we agreed on. I would hope that women come along to the forum, the society will be about the welfare of men and not about taking away from the rights of women. I'm hopeful people will start considering the welfare of men in the same way that they consider other people. Chair of the Women's Network Fiona Wood said, 
I have agreed with the men's forum because I believe there is a need for a safe space for men to talk. This is particularly true when it comes to matters involving inequalities in the legal system or fathers for justice. The main reason why we were against the creation of men's rights society in the beginning was because of the wording of the initial proposal. The vote was passed on to the students at Staffordshire University after the student panel at the meeting failed to reach a unanimous vote above 70%. The poll is expected to take place from March 10 to 12 as part of the Staffordshire University Leadership Race referendum. But this crap doesn't only happen in the UK. From the National Post in Canada. Robin Urbach on shocking anti-male hatred on the Simon Fraser University campus. The student union at Simon Fraser University in BC has made the apparently contentious decision to finance the creation of a men's centre on campus. Motivated Surely, by deep-seated patriarchal values, the union approved a budget of $30,000 to launch the project, the exact same amount conferred on the university's women's center, which was established back in 1974. The idea for the men's center was proposed by fifth-year accounting student Keenan Midgley, who told SFU's student newspaper that he believes men, too, are entitled to safe space on campus. Unsurprisingly, however, not everyone at SFU is thrilled with the decision. The Women's Center, for one, coolly brushed off the idea of a standalone men's center on its website, simply stating that the men's center is everywhere else. They did say they would welcome a men's center that focused on challenging popular conceptions about masculinity, confronting homophobia, sexism, racism, classism, and ability issues. In contrast, they would oppose a men's center that focused on maintaining the old boys club, that promotes the status quo, encourages sexual assault, or fosters an atmosphere of competition and violence. Oh. Okay, then. Good to know. Encouraging sexual assault? Really? Because whenever a bunch of straight dudes get together, they swap rape techniques, right? Unbelievable. And feminists have the nerve to tell us they don't hate men. Next. Several other students have taken a more direct approach, compiling their objections to the Men's Center in widely circulated five-minute YouTube video. Deeming the project not financially responsible, students take turns expressing their grievances. One woman with seemingly impeccable foresight declares that the Men's Center will end up being a place to celebrate hegemonic masculinity. She later attacks the credibility of the center's proponents, scoffing that they have no experience being in a gender studies class. Men, too, join in the criticism of the proposed center, one curiously warning that it may become a highly masculinized space. Another cautions that the project risks creating a heteronormative space, while yet another critical male dismisses the men's center as simply a room with APS3 and a bunch of douchebags playing games. The video in question got a lot of negative feedback and was taken down. But Jonathan Taylor saved it and uploaded it. If you haven't checked out Jonathan's channel, I highly recommend it by the way. Link below. Anyway, here's the video. Please note, the jump cuts are from the original, and it has not been altered. I don't think the Men's Center is fiscally responsible for uh, the student society right now. The project is not financially responsible. I'm uncomfortable with uh, $30,000 being allotted to a center with no clear mandate. How can you think that because there's enough money to do that, you should be able to? Students are paying more in tuition and fees than they've ever paid. When you have all these other groups that have to work tooth and nail for years to, to get somewhere, to get funding like that. The privileging of creating a men's space over other advocacy groups applying for funding and space opens itself up to a lot of outside criticisms. Considering there isn't a men's movement to uh, liberate men from women and from the gender inequalities imposed on men, I don't think that there's as much of a mandate to create a men's center. Men have a lot of access to space that women don't have when we talk about having a women's center as a safe space. The men's center is not about gender equality. It is not about being fair to the men at SFU. It's a bit different than, different than talking about a men's center as a safe space. You need to have a community. It needs, it, it's essential in order to have the safe space that we want. 
you need to build the community first. I think there's a possibility for the men's center um, to become a highly masculinized space if it's not given a clear mandate for inclusion. I think there's the potential that it would become a heteronormative space. It does not take into account marginalized or subordinate men. Experiencing sexual assault or has depression or is grappling with any of those issues would want to enter a space where... A room with a PS3 and a bunch of douchebags sitting around playing games? Is it going to be trans inclusive? In which um, victimized men would not feel comfortable discussing victimization. Victimized men might not feel comfortable. where you don't have a mandate, something where you don't have a goal, an idea of what the place is going to look like. The Men's Center will end up being a place to celebrate hegemonic masculinity rather than being a place to include all different types of masculinity. It is not collaborating with the other social justice groups at SFU. There is a sexual assault working group on campus right now and I know that they have not been contacted. It's significant for them to, to work with the other groups so that you can Make sure that you're being inclusive to, to all the different forms of masculinity. If the point of a men's center is to have a space where men can feel safe, then you should make sure that you're being inclusive to all forms of masculinity. Those include subordinate and marginalized men. Hey, some women have cocks. Jeff McCann, Keenan Midgley, and Danielle Hornstein are not the best people to be creating a men's center. It's coming from a space of hegemonic, privileged masculinity. People who are proposing the Men's Center, Jeff McCann, Keenan Midgley, and Danielle Hornstein, have no experience of being a subordinate or a marginalized man. They have no experience of being in a gender studies class. They're not consulting with people who do have some information about these things and who, who can provide a, a better foundation to build this Men's Center on. They must work with other social justice groups on campus, such as the uh, Women's Center. Or out of campus. To make it better, to make it good, make it something nice. You know, I encounter catcalling, I've been followed. I think these are pretty standard experiences for a lot of women out there. SFU took so much care of gender issues and women's safety. And I don't think that, that especially straight cis men go through their daily lives experiencing that. In a safe enough way where it's not going to look like it's a fight against women. I'd be in support of a men's center that was liaisoning with um, SF Kurg and the women's center and out on campus to create a safe space. I think everybody on campus would want to support a space that would help men deal with issues. I worry that that space isn't going to be a social justice space, it's just going to be another boys club. Creating one of the first university men's centers is a highly politicized event. This, this proposal has, has created controversy among students at SFU. With the controversial nature of this project, there needs to be greater financial and political oversight. We need to actually have a clear mandate for inclusion. In order for this project to go forward, there must be budgetary controls. This project is not fiscally responsible. I feel like this process has to go into the, the same processes that other spaces on campus have. There hasn't been nearly enough discussion on campus uh, for a project of this magnitude. With such a controversial project, I believe that there should be stricter budgetary controls in place to make sure that we know where the money is going to be going. So vote no. Don't you just love the way they all assume that it's going to be a boys club for white straight male jocks whose only issues in life are playing PlayStation games with their dude bros? It never crosses their minds that white straight men might share issues with gay men or black men or Asian men or whatever. But their entire world is built on gender and race stereotypes, where a person's group identity is more important than their needs. Narrow-minded brainwashed bigots, every one of them. But back to the National Post article. Bravo, students. In your attempt to decry the proposed men's center on all of its supposed merits, you have effectively demonstrated why such a space is so very necessary. At present, there is only one other Canadian campus with an official support center for men, the Men's Resource Center at the University of Manitoba. Judging by the crass sociology catchphrases in the aforementioned video, 
the consensus is that young men don't need community resources or support. That is a myth. While statistics show that comparatively, far fewer university-aged men are diagnosed with depression than women, the rate of suicide among men is four times as great. It's not hard to connect the dots, men are suffering in silence. And it's not hard, either, to see why. If the assumption on campus is that men have no use for a resource center other than meeting up with new PlayStation buddies, it becomes that much more difficult for them to break down the barrier of bravado. Men, like women, struggle with issues of victimization, anxiety, and depression, but they must battle in addition with a societal expectation of stoicism. In short, it's not manly to talk about your feelings. And it's precisely for that reason that a men's center on campus is such a necessary initiative. If brought to fruition, the men's center at SFU might also come with additional boons. Namely, the latent effect of debunking some of the prejudicial, discriminatory, and misandrous views, see kids? I can play too, so blatantly expressed in the YouTube video. Of course, I don't have a gender studies degree, so consider it mere speculation. And I have to totally agree with that. There is one more thing I should point out about the SFU Men's Center controversy, courtesy of Jonathan Taylor's video once again. Here are yet more things taken down by the uh, by Simon Fraser University uh, during that debacle. Uh, in particular, a page for the SFU Women's Center, uh, the same center whose feminists are trying to stop the formation of a men's center. Uh, this page features some rather hateful propaganda. Here is a pertinent quote from the page. Though still in its conceptual form, the Male Allies Project is the brainchild of the Women's Center, designed to bring self-identified men together to talk about masculinity and its harmful effects on both men and women. We know that many men are concerned with the way masculinity denigrates women by making them into sexual objects, is homophobic, encourages violence, and discourages emotional expression. Imagine if such a thing were said about any other group of people. And remember, we have to listen to these same feminists, both number one, tell us that men can't have a men's center because men don't suffer from sexism, and uh, number two, that feminism is <laughs> already working on men's issues, so there's no need for any men's groups at all. What better way to help men who are depressed, and possibly suicidal, than to tell them they are suffering from the feminist version of original sin, where just being born male, automatically makes you one of the bad guys. But don't worry, if you agree to throw other men under the bus, while declaring masculinity is evil, I'm sure they will give you a little pat on the head. After my end credits I'm including an interview with Sage Gerard, aka Victor Zen. I've had to edit it heavily to fit some of the key points in, so I would highly recommend you watch the entire thing if you haven't seen it already. Link below as always. Well that's it for another episode, so until next time folks, always remember, don't drink the poison Kool-Aid. SFU student Natasha Cleary Dulé is creating controversy with a YouTube video objecting the proposal for a men's center at SFU. I feel like a lot of people either haven't watched the entire video or maybe don't understand the context in which it was made. It's not that I'm opposed to the idea of creating a men's center. I'm opposed to how they've gone about creating it, the lack of discussion that has happened, um, and the lack of planning and programming. The video already has close to 3,000 views. When you have all these other groups that have to work tooth and nail for years to, to get somewhere, to get funding like that. Many of the comments are negative. As one comment says, the very existence of this video illustrates why a men's center should exist. It's not a man-hating endeavor. It's not anything like that. It was um, created really just to give people who felt like they weren't being heard a voice. Although some are against the $30,000 proposal, there are others who feel the men's center isn't a bad idea. I do feel that a lot of men are put under a lot of pressure to conform to different societal ideas as masculinity. So I think having a men's center or some sort of discussion group could be very beneficial to it. Society and media culture kind of has men stuff their feelings and discussion and communications are pretty low amongst uh, male peer groups, I think.
No one from the Student Society who passed the proposal was available for comment. Nicole Reiner in Burnaby for BCIT Magazine. When, when, when Zen Men was Kaesum, we had activist projects like bringing uh, new literature to the inter, uh, interdisciplinary studies department, which they've made very difficult for reasons I will talk about later, and, um, we, and also audit a self-defense course for, uh, that is supposedly for men on campus, such as um, possible plagiarism within their manuals, telling men that they are responsible for all violence against women and things of that nature, and our goal is to try to get that program replaced. We've made some strides to that, but we have to continue that into next year. And we've also started discussion on the development of a men's center in which Zen men would have a part in a volunteer effort to help, actually. We, um, so we have the development of a men's center, a auditing of a corrupt course, uh, a corrupt program from a third party, really, and the introduction of gender uh, of new gender literature, and um, we've also been donating food to the homeless. We've been doing a lot of things that have been helping make the campus community a better place. But of course, a lot of this has been uh, opposed by people who just don't like the brand. Let's just put it that way. Okay. So basically, what happened was that when I was uh, pushing for KSU men's development. I'm going to use KSU men. I'm going to say KSU men when I'm referring to the time period when it was known as KSU men, but I'm going to use that with Zen men interchangeably just for so no one gets confused. But when KSU men, KSUM, was pushing its message of humanitarian non-feminism, we, we use the term non-feminism a lot because we wanted to leave room for, you know, everybody who, you know, egalitarians, humanitarians that just aren't of the persuasion to come over and have a space to talk. But non-feminism was interpreted as an anti-feminist attack onto the feminist community. And, of course, the only people who say that are, guess who, feminists. <laughs> and um, when they ended up coming to uh, protest, in essence, we it started very light, right? People just throwing out slinging mud from afar. But we ended up uh, having faculty from the interdisciplinary studies department on campus start to spread some very inflammatory stuff. And just so you all know, the Interdisciplinary Studies Department, which I'll abbreviate as ISD, is the home of the Gender Studies Program. The, gen the, the Interdisciplinary Studies Department had a had pretty much had a bone to pick with KSUM since the beginning, and they started making an organized effort to remove our faculty sponsors. And for those, and again, for context, faculty sponsors are people in student organizations who are employed by Kennesaw State University and who, through their uh, being signed on as an advisor or faculty sponsor, they can connect the organization with other campus services. If you don't have a sponsor, you can't rent out cameras. If you don't have a sponsor, you can't rent out big spaces. So it's very important you keep sponsors. ISD has been trying to get rid of our sponsors. They do this by contacting our sponsors directly and just telling them whatever they think will get them to leave. And they've succeeded with two of our advisors. And the first of our advisors, uh, Dr. Liza Davis, was somebody who, um, you know, I had a great relationship with her. I think she's great. But what ended up happening was that she got – because I have reliable sources that say that I have a philosophical issue with this group. I asked what those sources were. She refused to tell me. So I went off to do an Open Records Act request, and faculty emails are open to public inspection. So I checked her emails. That's when I discovered Tom Penn, and that's when I discovered my arch nemesis, the Interdisciplinary Studies Department. And the Interdisciplinary Studies Department also has been bugging our current advisors, even up to today. Uh, in fact, I'm not going to name our current advisor for, I think, obvious reasons at this point. Yes. But they, they, they know him, and they've been going to his office physically to pull his ear. Uh, they've done it on multiple times and um, trying to get him to leave, trying to break so, off. Um, but anyway, when I learned about the department chair, Robbie Lieberman and Tom Penn, that's when I st – uh, Robbie Lieberman's the one that goes to our current advisor, okay, at least one of them anyway. So I sent them emails. I sent Tom Penn an email saying, look, your – Correspondence has caused a kind of a chain reaction here. Can we discuss this so we can clear something up? 
And Robbie Lieberman, I sent her an email saying, look, our advisors by default are not liable for organization operations. If you have a grievance, bring it to me. They never responded. But I did end up with a letter from the KSU Legal Division saying, if you contact anybody in the Interdisciplinary Studies Department again, then we will, you risk pressing charges for retaliation. And I couldn't go into the offices either. The, uh, the idea is that if I were to bring up m the subject of my allegations, it was, yeah, it's, it's that whole story of you can't contact your accuser. Yeah. Now, um, K KSU Legal cited two exhibits in the, in the letter. And they cited the um, me putting up AVFM stickers in bathrooms, including one women's restroom. At the time, the restroom was empty. You know, I did not do anything that would violate the privacy of others. I stuck to public property, and I would not do anything that was, you know, obviously in violation of the law. That uh, the citation of my uh, posting up the stickers has started an allegation campaign by ISD, and they said that this was uh, the gender studies coordinator, uh, Stacy Keltner has stated that I'm demonstrating a desire to kill women, to my <laughs> fantasies. I'm sorry, I know I'm not supposed to laugh. In order to, to, to make that, that a complaint of that nature, they probably had to go scour your blog to even find out yes. that you had done it to begin with, and then presented that as... Oh, that was, that, that's one of the key facts here. One of the key yeah. facts is they had to go out and seek something. Yeah. Now, um, a KS, somebody in KSU Owl Radio, the radio station there on campus, that there were police reports made against me. And at the time, uh, leading up to that point, I didn't know there were any. In fact, I think you even asked me, do you have, do you know of any police reports? And I said, no, I don't know of any. But then it turns out there were. They, none of those things escalated to an investigation. I looked at them. This is when I learned about the things that the ISD, you know, has been al alleging me to do. One of them even said that I was just acting weird. That's it. They just said I was acting weird, and they, they you know, I, I was looking at books, and I asked if I could check them out, and I was at the interdisciplinary studies offices before the letter was sent, and I was, you know, looking at the books and seeing right. for my book, and so that just made me think, wow, these, again, these are faculty members, and when I saw these reports and I saw the letter, I mean, I will admit I was reduced to tears on more than one occasion because I couldn't imagine how somebody who doesn't even know the student in question could say such heartless things over a philosophical disagreement. And I, I say philosophical generously, ideological, ideological yeah. in nature. And um, what's amazing is that I've looked through the emails they've sent in the Open Records Act. They've been having meetings specifically about KSU men, calling it a problem on campus. It's clear that there's an organized effort. And I have an open records request pending to see what else they've been saying in the meantime, because I'm this is this is this is not I will not believe, I just do not buy that these people are operating with unprotected. Absolutely speech. incredible about all this is that I've never throughout this entire thing, I have never received any assurances by KSU legal that I will have any protections for my Title IX right to a non-hostile environment. To give you an idea about how fucked up this is, the April 4th directive, the Dear Colleague letter, actually protects me here. A student has a right to a non-hostile environment, and the school is required to respond in a timely manner to make sure that the, not, the hostile environment is not there when handling an investigation. I've seen no moves for that. The um, Accusing me of wanting to go out and kill women, I would think is borderline, you know, it's borderline libel as it is. But if we look also at the fact that they've been approaching, you know, physically approaching people associated with Zen men, and also the fact that I didn't, I failed to mention this earlier, they've also gone to my supervisors at my job. I work at KSU in the information systems department. They've gone to my supervisors and accused me of, had, they filed little verbal workplace misconduct allegations. And I, I just, I'm amazed, I really am, that they would come to my job, something that's not even relevant to what I do. Heard from my supervisor that comes into my office one day and he says, Sage, I heard that somebody's hired a bodyguard to repel you, what's that about? And I'm like, what the fuck is happening? So I found out later that there was no bodyguard. That was just some other thing that got blown up from a rumor. But, of course, at this point, I'm freaked out. This is when I start getting really scared because these are people that don't care if I lose my job. They don't care if I lose my academic career, and they don't even want to know me. 
They just want me to go away because I'm not feminist. 